Chapter 57, The Fire. Strange sounds were echoing from the far side of the pond. What started as a low murmur gradually swelled to a chorus of terrified voices. There was an eerie glow in that part of the forest, and a thick plume of smoke began rising up from the snowy treetops. Roz charged against the ice and found the second lodge completely engulfed by a raging fire. Frightened animals were running in every direction, fleeing for their lives through the deep snow. "'What happened?' shouted Roz as Broadfoot galloped wildly past. "'We put too many logs in the fire pit,' he said without stopping. The flames climbed up to the ceiling. "'My baby is still in there!' cried a mother hare, pointing at the burning lodge. "'Somebody help, please!' Roz didn't hesitate. She plowed through the snow and ducked into the lodge. Flames and smoke were everywhere. A tall stack of logs, logs blazed in the fire pit, and in the far corner, a tiny ball of fur was shaking with fear. Crouching low, the robot wound her way beneath the smoke and around the flames and gently scooped up the young hare. Do not worry, Roz yelled over the roar of the fire. You are going to be okay. She turned to leave, but the doorway had started to crumble. So she shielded the hair with her body and smashed right through the walls of the lodge. Sizzling pieces of wood went flying as the robot and the hair burst outside into the soft snow. Oh, darling, you're all right, cried the mother hair, pulling her daughter close. Thank you for saving my baby, Roz. Now that everyone was safely away, the robot turned her attention to putting out the fire. Her glowing eyes darted around as she computed a plan. Then, with all the strength in her legs, Roz launched herself high up into the snowy branches of the nearest pine tree. A moment later, the tree was shaking violently and heaps of snow were sliding from its branches and pouring onto the flames like an avalanche. Steam hissed up through the smothering mound of snow. The flames quickly died, the snow quickly melted, and within minutes, all that remained was the charred foundation of the lodge. Roz dropped down from the tree and waited as the frightened animals slowly returned. Then she said to them, Would you like another lodge? The animals looked at one another, unsure of what to do. Understandably, they were afraid of another fire breaking out, but they were far more afraid of the deadly cold. So they pulled together and worked with Roz and built a bigger, better lodge on top of the old one. It had a taller ceiling and a deeper fire pit. It was made with more and less, more rock and less wood, and it had a supply of water for emergencies. But the most important safety features of this rebuilt lodge were the lodgers themselves, who now had a whole new respect for fire. Chapter 58, The Conversations. Thanks to Raz's truce, life inside the nest was mostly harmonious. But when the animals went outside, it was business as usual. Sometimes a lodger wouldn't return. Sometimes a lodger would return in the belly of another lodger. As you can imagine, that made for some awkward moments. So when everyone was gathered around the fire, they tried to keep things pleasant by having conversations like these. I wonder what Bright Bill is doing right now. Chit Chat lay on her back and looked at the ceiling as she spoke and where he is and who he's with and if he ever thinks about us back here on the island. I'm sure he thinks about us, said Roz. I think about him all the time. I like to imagine that the geese had a fun flight to the wintering grounds and now Brightbill is floating on a lovely lake eating yummy food and making wonderful new friends, but hopefully they're not too wonderful because I'd like to stay his best friend if possible. That's a nice thought, said Roz but I worry that the flat flock might have gotten caught in this icy weather. I do not think they will handle it well. Don't worry, I'm sure they're fine, said Chit Chat. Bright Bill is such a great flyer and I know he'll keep the flock out of trouble. He is a great flyer, said Roz, but I still worry. Life is short. Dig down the old ground, groundhog was giving another one of her fireside speeches. I'll be lucky if I see the spring. I don't want your pity. I've had a good run, but I'll tell you what, if I could do it all over again, I'd spend more time helping others. All I've ever done is dig tunnels. Some of them were real beauties too, but they're all hidden underground where they're no good to anyone but me. And they weren't even good to me this winter. Now the beavers, they have it all figured out. 
They built that beautiful dam, which created a lovely pond that made all our lives better. That must feel mighty good. The beavers made our lives better in another way, said Fink. They taught Roz how to build. Ain't that the truth, said Dig Down. Roz, you must have saved half the island with your lodges. And to think we used to call you a monster. I'll repay my debt to you if it's the last thing I do. Your friendship is payment enough, said Roz. Oh, please, your sweetness is going to make me sick. There must be something we can do. Your friendship really is enough. Friends help each other, and I will need all the help I can get. My mind is strong, but my body will not last forever. I want to survive as long as possible, and to do that, I will need the help of my friends. The animals listened quietly to Roz and thought of their own struggles to survive. Life in the wilderness was hard for everyone. There is no escaping that fact. But the robot had made their lives a little easier. And if ever they could, the animals would return the favor. I have seen 93 winters, far more than any of you, Crag the turtle spoke slowly, but everyone always listened to his words. And I can tell you that the winters have gotten colder, and the summers have gotten hotter, and the storms have gotten fiercer. I heard that the ocean has gotten higher, said Chit Chat, but I don't see how that could be true. I mean, where would all that extra water come from? You are right. The ocean is higher, said Crag. My grandfather used to say that long ago, this island was not an island at all. It was a mountain surrounded by flat lands. And then the ground shook and the oceans grew and the land slowly flooded until the mountain became the island. Animals from far and wide were forced to come here to escape the floodwaters. In those early days, there were too many animals living in too small a place. The island did not have enough food to feed them all. But between fighting and disease and famine, a balance was finally reached. And we have kept the balance ever since. Chit Chat's eyes grew wide with concern. If the ocean keeps rising, the island will be swallowed up by the waves and I don't even know how to swim. If the waves ever do swallow this island, it will not happen for a very long time, said Crag. By then, we will all be long dead, even me. Everything has a purpose. It was Swoop Swooper's turn to lecture the lodgers. The sun is meant to give light. Plants are meant to grow. We owls are meant to hunt. We mice are meant to hide. We raccoons are meant to scavenge. Roz, what are you meant to do? I do not believe I have a purpose. Ha, I respectfully disagree, said Swooper. Clearly, you are meant to build. I think Roz is meant to grow gardens. Roz is definitely meant to care for Brightbill. Perhaps I am simply meant to help others. Chapter 59, the, the Spring. Dripping water, flowing water, splashing water. Winter's blanket of snow and ice was finally beginning to melt. White was fading away to expose the grays and browns that had been hidden underneath. Little green buds were appearing all over. Crowds of bright flowers were rising up from the dirt, and soon the island would be bursting with rich scents and colors. At long last, it was spring. The lodgers returned to their own homes. The hibernators emerged from their secret places. Roz roamed across the island and checked in with the beavers and the bears and all the friends she'd missed. Then the robot went home to work in her garden. After the bitterest winter anyone could recall, life was slowly returning to normal. However, it was a quiet spring. There were fewer insects buzzing, fewer birds singing, fewer rodents rustling. Many creatures had frozen to death over the winter. And as the last of the snow melted away, their corpses were slowly revealed. The wilderness really can be ugly sometimes. But from that ugliness came beauty. You see, those poor dead creatures returned to the earth, their bodies nourished the soul, and they helped create the most dazzling spring bloom the island had ever known. Chapter 60, The Fish Help, help! He's got my tail! Paddler was splashing and screaming in the pond. 
Mr. and Mrs. Beaver were nowhere to be seen, so Roz picked up a fallen tree branch and stomped into the shallows. Grab onto this, she said as she reached out with the branch. Paddler grabbed it with his big teeth, and the robot lifted him up out of the water. And there, hanging from the young beaver's tail, was Rockmouth, the grumpy old pike. In one quick movement, Roz pulled in the branch and gripped the fish with her two hands. Paddler flopped into the water where his parents suddenly appeared. What is wrong with you, Rockmouth? Mrs. Beaver dragged her son away. You've always been a nuisance, but this time you've gone too far. Do us all a favor, Roz, and toss him to the vultures. I cannot do that, said the robot, but I might be able to help. Roz placed Rockmouth in a deep puddle near the pond where he couldn't swim away. Then she waited for the fish to explain himself. Fish aren't very talkative, especially grumpy fish like Rockmouth. But eventually he opened up to the robot and before long she was waving for the beavers to join them. Rockmouth used to live in the river, said Roz as the beavers shuffled over. But you trapped him here when you built your dam. He has been angry about it ever since. That doesn't give him the right to attack my son, hollered Mr. Beaver. It most certainly does not, hollered Mrs. Beaver. I'd be upset too, said Paddler softly. I'd hate to be kept away from my home. Mr. Rockmouth, you should have said something sooner. The fish looked up from the puddle with a frustrated expression that meant, I tried, but no one was listening. Well, the situation had to be remedied, and you can guess who rose to the occasion. Roz was determined to get Rockmouth back to his home. After she explored the nearby waterways, it became clear that she would have to carry the great pike through the forest and across the great meadow to the nearest bend in the river. I need a large container, said Roz to the beavers, something I can fill with water so Rockmouth can breathe while I carry him home. I could make it myself, but I thought you might like to help. It couldn't have been easy to overcome her anger with Rockmouth, but after Mrs. Beaver had a chance to cool off, she finally came around. I suppose we're partly to blame for this whole situation, she muttered. Then the beavers did the right thing, and together they carved out a wooden barrel for the fish. Here you go, Mrs. Beaver rolled the barrel over to the puddle where the robot and the fish were waiting. This should work nicely. Rockmouth, I hope you're happy back in the river. Rockmouth just flicked his tail in a way that meant, Will someone please take me home now? Roz filled the barrel with water and a grumpy fish, and then they were off. She carried Rockmouth through the forest and across the meadow until she was standing on the riverbank. Welcome home, said the robot. Then she tipped the barrel and the, fl the fish plunked into the river. Rockmouth's face poked above the surface, and he flashed a big toothy grin, and then he quickly swam away. Music